Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back your state co-chair, Nathan Jones. All right. Everyone enjoy their lunch? Yeah. Everyone? Yes, good. Thank you for getting up for the photo and you're welcome for the weather. Of course, we planned on having inclement weather because we're here in the Northwest in Seattle. So we've, we have 300 ponchos here, as you've noticed, we handed some out. <laughs> Please feel free to take them home. Uh, they're not traveling back with me to Vancouver, so they're yours. Uh, keep in mind uh, next day's activities as well as Saturday if you're joining us. So if you do take one, please uh, use it. Um, these next set of speakers have each traveled their own career road through architect architecture and design, and will be sharing their experiences on how they've learned to bring different voices to the table to collaborate and communicate. The maker movement influences a broad spectrum of activity, including education, commerce, and entertainment. Imagine an attraction where an artifact you created was essential to the enjoyment of that attraction. Now imagine a makerspace where such an artifact can be created using new tools while gaining the experience that comes through the creative process. Well, get ready to meet that person leading the makerspace charge. I'd like to welcome to the stage, Mr. John Hogan. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm glad you're fed. Um, and hopefully you've passed the two drink men on them. Okay, let's see if we can get this thing running. There we go. Come on, let's see who's going to... Oh, here we go. We are human beings, and we make things. Now, <clears throat> these Neolithic artifacts are everyday items for, for our ancestors, but they're made with such a refined quality and, and subtlety that I say it's, it's enviable neat to an industrial designer. In fact, on one of the tables out there, you'll see some genuine artifacts on this, and I recommend you handle them to feel how it does in the human hand and understand what it is to be a human so many years ago. We've been making things for eons, for our epochs, and we can define them. The standard of Ur from Mesopotamia, the McDonald's container, are simply artifacts made by human beings. But what this is about is the Community College Maker Initiative done in California, in which 24 of the 114 colleges were selected and uh, charged to develop a maker space. And they did this on $17 million. Now, I don't know what the prices are up in Seattle, but $17 million in Southern California will get you a Beverly Hills fixer-upper. And in Northern California, you can buy an Eichler on an acre in Palo Alto for $17 million. So they were able to use their money well. In 1956, you could also take in that $17 million and bought Disneyland or Boeing's Prototype 707. The CC Maker Initiative, the Fab Lab, the maker space that becomes a true research laboratory. So these 24 community college campuses are basically talked into, whoops, I'm on the, yes, am I on the front? Yes, it is. 24 university level R&D facilities. And this is commercial equipment that has been scaled down to prototyping and small production. Laser cutters, later lasers that will cut and will <coughs> etch. We have literally desktop uh, abrasive water jets that you can cut through anything that's up to an inch thick. You got a diamond that's an inch thick, it'll cut through it. Uh, we have three and five axis machines that can work in both soft and hard materials, both woods, plastics, and metals. We have 3D printers that will print in varied degrees of plastics. What else do we have? We have uh, embroidery machines. So you can, literally one student embroidered an animation. They did, they did a walk cycle using the embroidery machine. So this equipment is suddenly tested out. And as I say, it uses Autodesk, uh, and <clears throat> Adobe software to run it. And so these software programs have a modest learning. They have, in some cases, large, but for this, a pretty modest learning curve. You're not learning to work a milling machine, not working to work a lathe, or anything like that to make your product. As I say, the students supplied the curiosity, imagination, and tenacity to take this stuff through. Now, we shared <clears throat> 
And to make this work, to truly make this work in, in the situation of California colleges or any colleges, is they were made independent. They were, they were not a departmental thing. They were independent of any department. And what it did was it, it restripted it of the silo mentality that affects education and schools these days. So we did this for three years. And we, we shared weekly meetings, we shared statistical information, we got some information out, and we really plowed along and worked along, and those, that information is actually available online. But what happened, and again, the experience of, of an individual like myself who has seen the past, I saw in this community, essentially, you know, the ability to make things, how can I best describe it? It's, it's basically the individuals were working like the labs that I saw at Hasbro Toys when I was working there, or the Disney labs during Epcot. They were fully concentrated, working on an idea and working it through. They didn't know that, they didn't notice it. I did, I saw that. So, what it also revealed, and this is where it's education, guys, hang in there with me, is that this became one of the few places in California colleges or any colleges in which the three domains of learning occur in this area. Singularly in other areas, maybe two more, but this is the place where all three domains were richly exploited for education. Now, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk about education, and I'm gonna go back to 1956. And that was the year that Benjamin Bloom, and again, this is one year before Sputnik sent everything crazy, and three years before Richard Feynman's, there's plenty of room at the bottom, who sort of started the concept of nanotechnology. And so Ben Bloom and his group out of Chicago write this extraordinarily popular book called Taxonomy of Educational Objectives. This classification of standard goals, of educational goals, handbook one, cognitive domain. Now, <clears throat> Bloom's taxonomy, and it's, as it's been called since, uh, is classified in the learning processes, and there are basically three learning processes, or domains of learning, kingdoms. The cognitive domain, the cognitive domain is the domain of learning, facts, figures, it's logic, it's science, it's, it's, it's the most defined domain that was done on this one. The second is the effective domain, the kingdom. This is the kingdom of the emotional learning that we do as human beings. And, and why we can't necessarily measure those aspects as easily as we can in a test or a scantron, it is an effective and necessary type of learning. And finally, there is psychomotor domain, the kingdom of the physical learning. The learning that we take when we learn to write our name in script, the name, learning we would do in a sport, or learning to play a musical instrument, anything that requires coordinated physical effort and training. Now, American educators took to this like ducks to water. And they did it because they had a huge influx of kids coming into the whole situation. And as I say, it's a, it's a vaccine. It's like Salk's vaccine for teaching. And I can scaffold really well under the, under the domains that Ben Bloom figured out. But as I say, everything was, up, was coming up roses education-wise except for one thing. They forgot to define the effective and psychomotor domains. And they could not define it as well as the cognitive dom domain. So what happens is American education kind of shifts into the cognitive domain, so much that it becomes the, the cognitive bias of modern education. Now this is why I'm talking to all of you, which I can't even see at the top and the folks in the bottom who get a little light. This is where I need your help. Your simple task is to tell a convincing story a compelling story that resonates with your audience. This story is experienced on the intellectual, uh, physical, emotional levels as well. And it's such, so commanding that they want to experience again. Go to any of your places. You'll stand 45 minutes in line for a two and a half minute show and then run around, get the back of the line for another 45 minutes to catch that. 
man, show me a business that does that. <laughs> this is it. Now, you effortlessly do this. You may not think about it, but you do this better than anybody else on the planet because you have an obligation to reach your audience. You're highly trained, you're highly talented, you're highly motivated, and you love your audience. And you love your audience because they pay for this stuff and you, you can go and work in this business. Now, how this works is simple, and you've seen it again. Classic is, is Main Street Disneyland. Disneyland was done forced perspective by a bunch of old Hollywood designers. And they used forced perspective because it works good on television and it works good on stage. But what it does psychologically, again in the effective domain, is I start with an adult at the opening on there. And as they go along, everything seems smaller at the top. I'm actually playing with their childhood experience. So by the time they're at the end of Main Street, they're kids again. And they're very accepting of this place. Another area is, of course, the Blue Bayou, the Disneyland scene of the pirates. This lovely, you know, languid mise-en-scene, tranquil, bereft of mosquitoes. Should be 10 billion mosquitoes in this place. You're like swatting them like out here. But oh no, we, 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 we've done a little antiseptic on it. But what happens is that's a gentle quality of a ride. And then suddenly you pivot almost 180 degrees, almost back on yourself, and you drop. And that's the physical domain taking over in terms of learning. Now, along with this past examples and experiences, there's another aspect I want you to think about, and that is the idea of pedagogy, the, the, the art and craft of teaching. Now, you have your own pedagogy within, within the creative arts. You practice similar pedigree and the craft of themed entertainment design using the tools and technology of the present to tell your stories. Now, the story, successful story and experience occur, interacts with the audience on intellectual, emotional, and physical levels. And you, you set it up and say, what are we doing here? Let's do something neat. And usually what comes out is that. So... I want to remind you that as designers, you're, you tell stories that maximize the tel storytelling experience. You naturally draw from the three domains. And since you know you can teach better than most, I'd kind of like to guys, have you guys go back to teaching. I don't know whether it's at a school or anything like that, maybe on your own. And the place I want you to start is at the bottom. Now, this is in reference to California. It's probably true of every state. But let's take a look at, at the, the numbers of students you can go after and the potential to teach or incorporate into this business the next generation. So I'm really not talking to you. I'm talking to the kids you know, who are back in school and I need your help to get them. So take a look at these, these nice figures. CalArts, there's 1,800 students there at any one time, more or less. Art Center, 1,500. UC System has a quarter of a million students in there. The, the CSU, the California State University, has ha almost half a million. But the California community colleges have 2.2 million students. Now, if we're going to study it from the concept of a bell curve in which you have, you know, a large group of people who are okay at it, a small group of extraordinarily bad at it and extraordinarily good at it, put in the numbers. If you punch up the numbers, you're extraordinarily good students will be of higher level in terms of quantity at the community colleges. This is why you want to start at the bottom. The other aspect is just plain economics. I would have loved to have gone to Art Center. I would love to have gone to CalArts. CalArts, when I started school, CalArts for one year was four years at the, at the state colleges. So, let's take a look at economics. Instead of selling college or degrees, Think of the colleges as burger stands selling cheeseburgers. So, here's our CalArts hamburger at a $16.66. 666, six, six. that's it's a devil of a burger, I will tell you that. Art Center, which of course says, well, we're Art Center burger, um, is $14.75, it's gone down in price. The UC system has $4.41. 
And CSU, even better, $2.27. But here we are at the California Community Colleges, and we're selling hamburgers at 46 cents each. Which hamburger would you pay for? The one without the bread. Okay, those of you who are traditional on this, are you willing to pay $16 for the thrill of having a hamburger? You want a 46 cent hamburger, don't you? That's where your audience is on this one. It's the same identical figure, look at this. Same sponge loaf, sesame seeds, same American processed cheese, same 80-20 hamburger out of Harris Ranch. The, the lettuce is, was picked in Delano yesterday. <sighs> Ketchup, mustard, all the stuff. It's the same thing. And if you're poor and scruffy, that's where you go. So on final thoughts in this part of the lecture, Somewhere on this planet Earth, there's a 10-year-old who's writing her second utility patent on an invention she did in Tinkercad. She doesn't need you. When she's 12 and opens her own company, and, <clears throat> and she's going to be the first 12-year-old billionaire on the planet, you'll work for her. I want you to go after the younger version of yourself, the scruffy, unwashed, brimming with potential talent, stumbling through a world that tries its damnedest to suppress curiosity and imagination. So you need to go after those guys. So to tell this in a little bit better of a story, since this is about storytelling, I'm going to do a little story and let's see if we can hear the message in this. And it, the working title is Dr. Bloom and the Lost Kingdoms of Domain. I couldn't afford any music at this time. I would have got ripped, you know, stolen from something else. Stendum pecunisum. My bad Latin for it. Show me the money. It's early 56, before Sputnik, before Elvis, before Helvetica. Dr. Bloom, perched high in his ivory tower, I look, peers down through his Alvin Clark telescope to the trained on the 40 million or so baby boomers that are meandering about on the planet. They're wearing Kuzgad caps. They're aimlessly watching Howdy Doody on black and white television sets. Again, back to the ivory tower. Holy jumping catfish boys, exclaimed Dr. Bloom to his cohorts. We're going to be up to our armpits and all these little brats in no time. And we got to come up with a good plan to push these kids through college like green grain through a goose. Or we're just going to have to pack our bags and find real work. <laughs> Dr. Bloom and the boys thought long and hard into the wee hours of the early afternoon. Groggy with exhaustion and hunger. A sudden knock on the door. <clears throat> And it wakens them. Thank God for graduate students, was the hue and cry. Whoops, back. As they munched their graduate student delivered burgers, fries, and shakes, one of the boys had sudden insight. By the way, this is 1956, keep this in mind. If we could graduate students as consistent as that McDonald's guy makes these hamburgers, we could be rich. And that meal was the start of the quest. There's our guys. Dr. Bloom and his boys in tailored suits of hand-woven Harris tweed, outfitted by the very famous Abercrombie and Fitch before they discovered the tween market, with empire surplus pith helmets atop their heads and cartridge loops stuffed with Parker 75s. They set out for the frontier. Frontier. <laughs> Hacking through the dense ivy undergrowth of the dreaded Hutchins hobo jungles. I'll see if anybody reckons that. No. Um, <clears throat> they go chance upon a clearing, revealing a hitherto undiscovered country of three mighty kingdoms. Maybe these folks know something, muttered Dr. Bloom, as they entered the first kingdom, the psychomotor kingdom. Hacking, they're there. They were greeted by a citizen with a flourish and a bow. He said, welcome to Psychomotor, the kingdom of the physical. Here we build, we dance, we paint, we sculpt, we play, and with lots of slots of sports, and we... 
Dr. Bloom politely interrupted him, thanked him, and warmly but dismissively sent him away. Dr. Bloom and the boys left a little bit perplexed to the next kingdom, the effective kingdom. They entered the second kingdom, and Dr. Bloom asked a passing resident, oh, what do you do here? We write. This is promising. Plays. Hmm. Fiction. Hmm. Poetry. We even write science fiction. Oh, my God. You've got to be kidding. Oh, and then we perform what we write in public before an audience. Doc and the boys left bewildered. They f- psycho motor? Is that a Hitchcock film or a Roger Corman film? Quipped one of them. Effective? There's a laugh in their heads off or crying their eyes out. They can't even comprehend this. They approach the last. Dr. Bloom says, here's hoping. And they preach the last kingdom, the cognitive kingdom. They enter a, a kingdom of books, literally, Literary, two. Everything's made out of books. The tallest building is books. The smallest knob on a, on a doll's furniture is made out of a little tiny book. Doc and his voice are intrigued. They approach an individual sitting on a bench made of books. That's individual Oxford comma sitting on a bench made of books. He was deep in thought. What, what do you guys do here? Said the good Doc. We think. After we think, we write down what we think, what we have thought. Cool. Then we lecture on what we have written. Super cool. And then, after the lecture, the writings are turned into books. Awesome. And then we read books. And then we read books and we think. It's kind of a rinse and repeat thing. (sighs) Doc and his boys were transfixed. Holy shit balls, boys, this is the ticket. Rejoice Dr. Bloom as he elaborated on his vision. It's just pencils, papers, and books. And gentlemen, we control the books. Lovely, expensive books that become obsolete at the end of each and every spring semester. We're going to be rich. The individual slightly interrupted and said, what of the other kingdoms? You know, aren't you going to include them? Dr. Bloom thought long and hard on this one and he really gave it some tight thought. And he smiled and he said, do you know how art supplies cost these days? God, then there's the music department with their expensive soundproof rooms. Worthwhile. And then there's dance, and they need a springy, springy floor so they don't hurt their feet as they bounce around. And don't get me started on theater. Oh, my God. I could, you realize I can run an entire philosophy department on for one year on the electricity churned by the performance of a, one, of a single <clears throat> performance. The boys were ecstatic. But the individual said, what about art? And to that, Dr. Moon quickly replied, English language arts. The end. I need your help. And thank you very much for this.